But what happens if a person has fallen and they're in sin, really living in sin, people have gone to them, tried to restore them, but they have resisted. They are not broken and they're defiant and they're uh, totally resistant to anybody that wants to restore them. What do you do with a person like that that professes to be a believer and by all accounts, they have trusted Christ and walked with them and now they're in sin and they don't want to return to the Lord. They won't acknowledge their sin. What do you do with them? How do you handle church discipline? Early in my ministry as an inexperienced pastor, I had to face that. I was a young pastor. I started a church. The church was growing. And one man was involved with us at the start of the church. And he was inviting everybody and he was at every meeting. But one Sunday he didn't show up at church. And uh, just before I went in to preach, his wife came up to me and said, uh, my husband's at home. And he told me last night that he's been involved in a series of affairs. Will you go over and talk with him after church? I said, certainly. I went into his home and uh, he was sitting there in a recliner, leaned back, watching a football game on television. Hardly looked up at me. And I said, Clyde, I have come to talk to you about your life and where it's headed. And your wife has shared with me some of the things you've been involved in. Immediately he became very defiant, very rebellious. I said, I'm here to help you get back on track with the Lord. He said, I don't need your help. And uh, yeah, that's true. That's what I've done and what I'm going to continue to do. And I've pleaded with him. I've said that we're here to help you. God will forgive you. You can get back in fellowship with him, with your family, with the church. But he continued to be resistant. I called him in with the leadership of the church. And he was very arrogant, very resistant to their counsel, to their love. And finally, after a period of time, we had no option other than to exercise church discipline. It was my first experience. And that raises the question about church discipline. What sins should be disciplined? When should church discipline take place? Who should administer it? Why should we even care about church discipline? And how do we balance God's love and mercy and grace with justice and truth? Well, here are the questions that we need to answer. What sins are personal and private and must be dealt with by the individual alone before God? There are some sins don't need to become public. A person can take care of them before God. That's it. Another question, what sins affect others, and therefore must include others in acts of repentance and restitution? Might be just one other person, just your wife or your husband. But what sins are designated in the Bible as those which call for action by the leaders and the congregation of the local church? And when you identify those, what are the processes and procedures that are called for in church discipline? First of all, let's talk about what sins call for church discipline. One thing you're going to hear me say in this lecture over and over again, because it needs to be emphasized very strongly, the only sins that need to be disciplined by the church and call for church discipline are sins that are persisted in continuously, deliberately, after being admonished, person continues down that path. Those are the sins that at some point in time need to be dealt with publicly and by church discipline. But when you look at the scriptures and you try to discern what sins are to be disciplined, here are the list. And you need to go through 1 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6, and pick out those sins. I won't take time in this lecture to go through all of chapter 5 and chapter 6. But chapter 5 particularly, the sins that need to be disciplined, is the sin of sexual immorality. 
sexual immorality that is persisted in. There was a man in the church in Corinth that was involved in a sexual relationship with his stepmother. Everybody in the church knew about it, but no one did anything about it. Three times in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says you need to put that man out of the church. And Paul came on stronger against the leadership of the church even than he did against the men because they didn't take any action. Sexual immorality. Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Romans 16, 17. Divisiveness. Remember in Proverbs 6, God says he hates those that sow seed of discord among the brethren. Sometimes there are people in the church that just have a divisive influence on the body by their gossip, by spreading rumors, and they create confusion in the body. And God wants the church to be unified. And one of the things that I have always worked so hard at is having unity in the body. Because Psalm 133 says, how good and how pleasant it is for, for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. When there's, not, when there's unity, God says, there I command my blessing. When there's not unity, the body is fragmented. The head of the body, Christ, can't work through that church because it's divided into factions. And we have to come strong against a person that Satan is using to sow seed of discord among the body. After they've been admonished, and you've talked to them, and we'll talk about the procedure, and they continue to do that, the church leadership cannot, must not, allow that to continue. That calls for church discipline. Another one that is surprising to many people is in 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 16 through 15. Those that lead an undisciplined life. Those that can work, but choose not to work, and want to live off the system, or live off the church, or live off the benevolence fund. Uh, if after they have been admonished, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. <laughs> it's very strong language in Second Thessalonians. But he says those that continue in that undisciplined life, lazy, selfish, living off other people, they need to not be allowed to continue in the fellowship. The other one in Second John, verses 7 through 11, 1 John 4, 1 through 3, Galatians 1, 6 through 9, those that are involved in false teaching, heresy, denying the deity of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ, coming up with teaching that is anti-scriptural or extra-scriptural, that just as doesn't square with the eternal principles of the Word of God. And after they have been corrected and talked about with their teaching, they want to continue to propagate their false teaching. At some point, they need to be disciplined. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com.